I want to apply some elementary economic considerations to the topic of uh, political centralization and uh, the session on, on the other hand. Um, let me begin just with, uh, with some sort of uh, descriptive um, observations. Um, we have all seen the Soviet Union um, collapse in, in front of our eyes and instead of the mighty Soviet Union uh, we have now some sort of uh, a dozen independent states on the former territory of it. Um, and, uh, and there are still groups on the territory that try to secede from the Soviet Union. Just think of the, the Chechens, for instance. Um, then we have seen uh, that uh, Yugoslavia, which was, by the way, an American creation after World War I, an art of completely artificial creation, had nothing, people had nothing in common in previous history, that Yugoslavia has, has fallen apart and there we have now in the meantime Serbia and Croatia and Slovenia and Bosnia and Macedonia and so forth and maybe we'll get some uh, Kosovo or whatever it is. In addition to that at one point, um, then we have seen um, Czechoslovakia, which again was an artificial creation due to American wisdom after World War I. Um, Czechoslovakia falling apart, the, the Czechs um, separating from the Slovaks. And, um, and we know that there are various minorities in various other places uh, that have expressed um, the secessionist desires. I mean, there are German groups of Germans in Poland, there are Hungarians in Slovakia, um, there are Germans and Hungarians in Romania, there are Turks in Bulgaria, and even if we go to Western Europe, uh, we know of independence movements in Scotland, um, one of the big proponents there, you might, you might all know, Sean Connery is one of the big uh, independence promoters in, in Scotland. Um, then we have the Northern Ireland problem. Um, then we have in, in Spain the Basques and the, the Catalans um, who would like to be independent. Um, we have uh, in Italy the South Tyrolians, the German-speaking minority in northern Italy. Um, we also have in Italy a party, the Lega Nord, that wants to get rid of the South uh, and, uh, and found, so to speak, an independent northern, northern Italy, uh, Padania, that is supposed to be called. Um, and then we have in Belgium um, some some independent oriented party that want to separate the Walloons from from the Flemish. That is the French speaking from the Dutch speaking part of um, um, of Belgium. On the other hand, we can say even though all these secessionist movements. Um, going on. Canada is, of course, another example, Quebec. Um, on the other hand, we can say we are closer than ever to the creation of a one-world state, um, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, because after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, only one superpower, the United States, um, remains in existence and the superpower has of course some sort of hegemonic control over 
Western Europe on the one hand, and also over some Pacific countries in particular, of course, um, over, over Japan. And uh, there are also centralization tendencies uh, within Europe with the establishment of the European uh, community. Um, and um, uh, centralization tendencies can also be seen um, in the fact that uh, there is some sort of international banking cartel uh, or has been established uh, in, in, the, in the sense that uh, most, most countries in the world use the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency um, uh, and backing up, so to speak, their own various national um, currencies. Um, if we take it, a look at history, um, we see both tendencies at work. Um, decentralizing tendencies we have not just seen recently with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, but uh, at the, um, uh, well, put it this way, it, around 1,000, uh, beginning of the last millennium, um, Europe consisted of some, uh, of several thousand independent political units. And in the 20th century, we ended up with, with a few dozen. Um, now, this does not mean that there was only centralizing, that there were only centralizing tendencies underway. We have, apart from the example that I gave of the Soviet Union falling apart, we have, of course, another few important decentralizing tendencies. Uh, for instance, the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire, um, dissolved gradually from the 16th century on until uh, the early 1920s with the establishment of, of Turkey. Or uh, another prominent example, the Habsburg Empire, which was at some point the largest empire uh, in the world, um, uh, gradually disintegrated from the height of its expansion under Charles V um, until it uh, yeah, until it became teeny tiny small Austria at the end of uh, of World War One. Um, but the overriding tendency in modern history is in the opposite direction. That is, in the centralizing uh, direction. Again, let me just give you some sort of illustration of this overriding uh, tendency. Um, after the Thirty Years' War, uh, that is 1648, um, Germany, for instance, consisted of 234 independent countries, of 51 free cities, and of 1,500 independent knightly, princely manors. Um, by the early 19th century, this number had already fallen to the upper 30s, or clearly less than 50 independent uh, units. And in 1871, Germany was established as a unified uh, political structure. Um, if we look at the Italian history, we find a similar, similar pattern. Very a uh, large number of independent units initially, and then in the 1860s, the unification uh, of Italy took place. Um, and we can find this sort of centralization tendency even in small states, such as uh, Switzerland. Um, Switzerland started in, in 1291 uh, as a loose association of three of three cantons, um, and uh, it took until 1848 um, before Switzerland emerged, so to speak, in the present uh, in the present size, uh, composed of 
uh, of about two t two dozen uh, cantons, but overarched by uh, by a central government. And we can see the centralization tendency not only in the sense that there are, so to speak, larger political units created, we can see also the centralization tendency within states. Um, that is, uh, the central government in the United States increased its power vis-a-vis -vis the power of the states that make up the United States. Um, yeah. The West German central government increased its power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the various individual states that make up West Germany and so forth. So there is also internal, internal centralization uh, going on. Um, now the the orthodox view on on these matters is uh, to say somehow that centralization is a beneficial um, phenomenon uh, is evaluated as something as something good and uh, decentralization or the session is generally regarded as something yeah an anachronism as something bad sometimes you cannot avoid that it happens but by and large you are not happy um, if it um, if it does happen. But what I want to convey here is that this is pretty much the view of the victorious forces in history. Uh, history is typically written by, by the victors um, of history. Since the centralization tendencies turned out to be the stronger tendencies, of course you get history written from the viewpoint of uh, of centralizer, so to speak. Um, and I want to show instead that um, that or from from the point of view of economic history, from point of view of economic theory, um, that the relationship is almost the other way around. That is that we should be very skeptical about centralizing tendencies and that we should be um, quite supportive of, uh, of decentralizing or the secessionist uh, tendencies. Now the implicit assumption of those who claim that centralization is good is basically to say that uh, uh, greater political <coughs> units and ultimately, so to speak, a world, a world government implies greater markets and greater markets imply, so to speak, uh, greater wealth. And in fact, if you look at, uh, at, the, uh, at the data, you can say, of course, wealth has increased while centralization was going on. But uh, recall from some other uh, lectures that I have uh, given um, some, sometimes it is history does not tell us did the wealth uh, in the Western world increase because of centralization taking place uh, or despite the fact that centralization uh, took place. Would the wealth in the Western world be even higher if no centralization would have taken place? Again, the historical data do not tell us this. Um, only a little bit of economic theory might be able to enlighten us on this uh, on this question. Now the first thing I have to make you aware of is that political centralization uh, and economic integration have simply nothing to do with each other. Um, political centralization means simply that the power of a state expands over uh, larger territories. And the power of the state means the power to tax and the power to uh, regulate. And economic integration uh, means that the division of labor is expanded, uh, that more and more people, wider and wider territories become integrated into the network of, um, uh, of the division of labor and in mutually beneficial 
exchange exchange relations. Um, so both things, economic integration and political integration, are entirely separate uh, separate phenomena. We can say, in principle, um, that institutions such as the government. Um, uh, do not promote economic integration. After all, if you tax and regulate market participants, uh, this tends to reduce uh, market, particip uh, market participation and, uh, uh, and economic uh, integration. But let's assume for a moment uh, there exists such a thing as uh, as a government, um, then we would say there exists no no direct relationship uh, between the size of uh, a government, the size of the territory ruled over by a specific government, and and the degree of um, uh, of economic economic integration. Uh, to give you to give you an example. Um, take the United States as a large country and take the former Soviet Union as a large, uh, large territory ruled by a government. We can say in the United States there existed, or still exists, uh, quite a bit of uh, economic integration. Uh, lots of in the, in independent firms, uh, market transactions within the United States, um, and so forth. And uh, wide integration, of course, also in, uh, into the international market. On the other hand, uh, the Soviet Union displayed very little economic integration. Um, all factors of production were socialized, uh, so no internal markets existed at all, and as far as the integration of the Soviet Union into the wider world market was concerned, uh, it was also almost non-existent. Uh, the Soviet Union had very little to sell in the um, in international markets. Um, so we have large sizes, and in one case high economic integration, in another case low economic integration. It can take small countries, the same, the same thing. Uh, there can be small countries such as Switzerland, which is uh, uh, highly integrated into the world market and has highly developed internal markets, and compare that with a place, let's say, like the former Albania, uh, another small country, but uh, hardly any relationships to the outside, to the outside world, and no developed internal markets uh, either. So we see in small places it is also possible that uh, um, that high economic integration can exist and also low economic integration can exist. However, there exists an important indirect relationship between size, uh, territorial size of, uh, of a government and um, and economic in economic integration, and I want to explain this uh, very important indirect relationship between size and economic integration. Um, all governments must begin very small. That is, we cannot imagine that a world government would arise uh, at the outset. Uh, governments begin as city governments, village governments, governments over very small, teeny tiny um, territories. And smallness uh, contributes to moderation on the part of governments. Mod by moderation I mean simply governments will tax and regulate comparatively little uh, if they are small. Why? Why is that? Uh, just uh, make a little thought experiment. Um, uh, ask yourself, for instance, if it would be possible for some sort of 
village government to do what yeah what the rulers of the former Soviet Union did that is to say not to allow any uh, inhabitant um, to own any capital goods um, and the answer would be if a small village government would just say, you, nobody here can own any capital goods, I, the, the, the village mayor or whatever it is, I'm in charge of all of, uh, all capital, uh, capital goods. You would, uh, very quickly have, uh, people either engaging in a rebellion against this mayor or simply leaving, leaving the place. Um, or ask yourself, would it be possible in a small, small village government that the government could take 50% or more of the productive output of the people living in that village? Um, and again, uh, this is, that is very hard to imagine uh, that you could do this without the village emptying out very quickly, people simply leaving, uh, leaving for uh, for better pastures than uh, than this. Um, now, the reason then for governments, small governments, having to be moderate is simply uh, that people can exit small places. Um, the next village is just a few miles away. You can just uh, move there if you have the feeling that. Uh, taxation and regulation is lower. Exit is comparatively easy under those, uh, under those circumstances. And even though the governments might want to crack down on their population more heavily, that is tax them more and regulate them more, they realize given the existence of a multitude of other small competing units in the immediate vicinity, um, they can only do so at the danger of quickly losing their most productive, uh, most productive citizens. Um, historians have explained, for instance, the, the rise of Europe to the dominant economic region, as compared, for instance, with places like China, which until about the 16th, 15th century was economically superior over, um, over Europe. Uh, historians have explained the, the rise of Europe to the predominant economic region um, by pointing out that Europe, in contrast to other regions of the world, was highly decentralized. Um, there's an important book by a French um, political scientist, I believe, Jean Bechler, uh, The Origins of Capitalism, he makes a point that uh, it was precisely the anarchistic structure of Europe, uh, that is, the splintering into numerous uh, political entities uh, that is responsible, so to speak, for the flourishing of, uh, of capitalism the moderateness of these various small governments contributed to the fact that uh, that enterprising people could uh, uh, could arise um, now to um, to an explanation how then are centralizing forces uh, set into motion? If we begin, so to speak, with a large number of independent political units, how does this ever change? Um, now, what we have to recognize here is that all states, even small states, are, of course, by nature, aggressive institutions. Uh, as I explained, if you can tax people, um, if you can externalize your own uh, 
the cost of your involved in your own aggressive activities onto others, you tend to be more aggressive than you would would be if you would have to pay the full cost of your aggressive activities out of your own uh, out of your own pockets. And states come into conflict with each other simply on account of the fact that there is a migration going on. That is, people leave from one place and move to some other place. Obviously, states do not like to see the population leaving. After all, they are in the business of milking the population. And if the, the milk cows, so to speak, uh, run away to different places, you, you are not satisfied with that. Um, uh, especially if, if your best milk cows uh, are, uh, are leaving. Um, so it is not difficult to see why governments come into conflict with each other. By nature they are more aggressive and they have r reasons to be mad at each other because people go from one place um, to another. So this of course then leads to interstate warfare. And interstate warfare uh, can be described, of course, as competition between states, but it is a very <coughs> p uh, peculiar form of competition. It is what we might call eliminative competition. Um, look, Ford and GM competing against each other, it is conceivable that at the end of, at the, end of the days, Ford and GM might still both be in existence and still compete against each other. Um, as far as competition between governments is concerned, this is not possible, not in the same way at least, because a government is of course a territorial monopolist of uh, uh, taxation and regulation. Obviously you cannot have two units on the same territory claim that I'm I'm entitled to tax uh, and I'm entitled to regulate. There can only be one state, one institution that is allowed to tax and to regulate on any given territory. So in this sense, uh, the competition between states is eliminative. One must be wiped out and another one takes over and expands its territory. Next question is then, can we say anything about who will win and who will lose in these interstate wars? Now, success or defeat in wars depends, of course, on many, on many factors. But let's assume for a moment that we are dealing with initially equally sized political units. I mean, if, if you ask uh, who will win in, in a war of the United States against Luxembourg, uh, the answer is, of course, clear as, clear as daylight simply by virtue of, of the size of the two, two parties involved. Um, but assume for a moment that we, as I explained, that all states initially were kind of small so that roughly equally sized states war each other. Can we say anything then about uh, the likely winners and the likely losers? And I think we can say with, uh, with some degree of certainty, uh, yes. Uh, uh, all wars require, of course, economic resources, um, weapons, ammunition, uh, a productive population that keeps turning out new weapons when the old ones get destroyed and so forth. Um, governments, as I pointed out, governments do not really contribute anything to productivity in a positive way. After all, they punish, so to speak, people for being productive. Um, but in a negative sense, governments have, of course, an influence on how prosperous or not prosperous their own population will be. 
in so far as they can engage in a low tax, low regulation policy, or they can engage in a high tax and high regulation uh, policy. Um, let's call governments that are nice to their own population, tax little and regulate little, let's call them liberal, liberal governments. Uh, and let's call the governments that heavily tax and heavily regulate illiberal uh, governments. Uh, now, when it comes to warfare, governments have, have to parasitically draw, so to speak, on, on the wealth that exists in societies. Um, and from that we can conclude, in a way, that uh, it will be the internally more liberal governments that, uh, that rule over a more prosperous population um, that will tend to win in these, uh, in these, uh, in these wars. Um, they just have more economic resources and economic resources are uh, of great importance when it comes to winning or not winning. Um, so we reach a, a seemingly paradoxical result. Um, the, the nicer states internally tend to be the more aggressive one as far as their foreign policy is concerned. Again, do you recall, all states are warlike. Uh, the nicer ones, however, know that they have a greater chance uh, of winning in, um, uh, in wars, and because of that, tend to be more aggressive in their foreign policy. Um, this, uh, um, let me give you, uh, jumping ahead a little bit, um, this helps you understand, for instance, the fact that if you compare the Soviet Union with the United States, or the former Soviet Union with the United States, um, uh, if you look at their internal policy, there's of course no question that uh, the Soviet Union was, so to speak, evil, a uh, terrible place, uh, big time oppression of the population and all the rest of it. And the United States, Internally, yeah, obviously not great, but comparatively speaking, infinitely better than what you had in the Soviet Union. On the other hand, if you look at their foreign policy, the Soviet Union has engaged in very few aggressive ventures. Um, uh, look, I mean, we have to say, all, all the uh, occupied countries uh, in, uh, after World War II uh, were the results of America giving, giving to the Soviet, giving them to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had uh, in the, tried to invade Afghanistan, um, uh, but they also withdrew from some places like, like Austria, for instance, which they had um, occupied. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the foreign policy of the, uh, of the United States, remember my lecture that I gave uh, yesterday, there was not a single year um, in, in the post-World War II era where the United States did not engage in military interventions in one place uh, or another. Um, now, you could ask the Soviet leaders, so to speak. Um, they knew exactly why they were comparatively peaceful as far as their foreign policy was concerned. Because they knew that they had the basket case economy on their hands. They knew that they could only win either against very small places, uh, to be by, the, by their sheer size, or in a surprise attack. That is, if you can win the war, whatever, in one week or two, week, two weeks. Um, uh, otherwise, if the war would have dragged out for a while, uh, their economy was just not capable of turning out the necessary 
um, weaponry and so forth in order to uh, sustain a long-lasting a long-lasting war. So I think it so might sound paradoxical, um, but we have a good explanation for the fact that the United States conducts an aggressive foreign policy and that the Soviet Union being a basket case economy, so to speak, they might have liked to take over the entire world. Uh, obviously they were bad enough to have intentions such as that, uh, but they were also not uh, well, they were also smart enough to realize that their economy simply would not permit them to do anything, uh, anything like this. Um, so given then that in wars there is a tendency for more liberal, in the European sense, more liberal states to expand their ter territory at the expense of less liberal states, that helps us to explain, for instance, um, that uh, um, that uh, Great Britain became a major imperial power, for instance, because it was internally very liberal and, of course, expanded its powers and uh, to uh, uh, far away places. And it helps us to explain, in the same way, uh, that the United States. Uh, gradually became, so to speak, the uh, the dominant power, inheriting, so to speak, the position um, from uh, uh, from England. Um, but you can also see that the larger, so to speak, the territories become that are controlled by states, the closer that is, the closer you come to. Uh, a single one world state, the less reason remain in existence for uh, state rulers to uh, to keep up their nice behavior and tax and regulate uh, their populations only moderately. Um, imagine for instance you would we would have a world state. Uh, in that situation, wherever you go, the same tax and regulation structure applies. Um, that is, there is no longer any economic reason for people to move from one place to another because the same rules and the same regulations apply at any, uh, at any place. And if you relieve states, so to speak, of this pressure that people simply might run away from you, go to nicer places, then of course the inherent tendency of all states to try to expand their power will come, um, will come into play. Um, you can see this, for instance, in, uh, in the case of the European community. Um, what does the European community do? The European community is sold to the public as some sort of free market. In fact, of course, it has absolutely nothing to do with, with a free market. Um, from the very beginning, it was uh, uh, a cartel uh, of various governments propping up some industries, uh, co coal and, um, and steel. Um, and um, the European community... Uh, is an is an organization that has produced yeah uh, uh, mountains of papers uh, that regulate uh, economic life internally and uh, ex externally. Um, there are uh, the tens of thousands of translators nowadays occupied, who whose task is to to translate the uh, the existing documents into the languages of those states that want to join the European community, the Czechs and the Slovaks and the Slovenes and whatever it is. So if you are a translator in those countries, uh, the European community created a big uh, employment program for translators in, um, in those places. Obviously, if the European community would be a free trade zone, you don't need any piles of papers at all. All you need is uh, 
uh, statement saying whoever wants to ship something out, he can ship it out, and whoever wants to buy something from another place, he can buy it. Two sentences are entirely sufficient <laughs> in, in order to do uh, in, in order to implement a free trade policy. The same, by the way, of course, applies also to the uh, North American so-called free trade agreement, which is also something like 1,500 pages, roughly, roughly speaking. Uh, again, the sheer size of the document immediately indicates that that cannot possibly have anything to do with, with free markets. So what the European community does is they, they harmonize the tax and regulation structure in Europe upward. Um, that is, if Germany regulates the beer industry and Belgium regulates the baking industry, then the inter European integration consists in the fact that Germany regulates baking and beer, beer brewing, and, 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 uh, and the Belgians do the same. Um, if Germany has tax A and uh, France has tax B, then the, the European integration consists in that Germany and France have both tax A and tax B. Um, okay. Um, so tendency towards centralization um, for a while that can have liberating effects because more liberal states expand their territory at the expense of less liberal places. But the relationship is, if you might use that term, is uh, dialectical. That is, once a certain size is reached, uh, the reason to remain liberal internally uh, uh, evaporates, disappears, and states then um, uh, follow their natural instinct, so to speak, and um, uh, and increase their tax load and their regulation, regulation load. Um, let me, uh, yeah, no, I'll leave that out. Let me now come to the, uh, to the question of, uh, of the session. Um, as I said initially, uh, there is no automatic relationship between size and uh, and economic um, uh, economic integration, but there but there does exist an indirect relationship between size and economic uh, integration, and the session <coughs> can in and of of itself have highly beneficial economic consequences and I want to just mention some of uh, some of them. Um, the first one is that in the course of centralization um, the phenomenon of forced integration was created. That is one group of people imposing themselves on another group um, of people. Um, one ethnicity, so to speak, ruling over another ethnicity, or one religious group ruling over another religious group. Um, in the case of Russia, for instance, the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, uh, there was generally and legitimately complaint from uh, many of the nationalities that existed within the territory of the Soviet Union, I think more than 120 different nationalities, ethnic groups, uh, different religions, languages, and so forth. There existed complaints from many of these diverse groups um, that they were ruled by the Russians, which were the uh, majority group within uh, within the Soviet uh, uh, Soviet Empire. Uh, that is, that the Russians ruled 
the Estonians, and the Russian ruled the Latvians, and the Russian ruled uh, whatever, the U Ukrainians, and who knows what. Um, and that was perfectly legitimate, this complaint. There existed, so to speak, exploitation of certain ethnic groups by the ruling ethnic groups. That was also true in the case of Yugoslavia, for instance. Um, the Slovenes and the Croats complained that they were exploited by the Serbs, which were the dominant ethnic group in former, um, in former Yugoslavia. Um, now, by means of, uh, of the session, um, these uh, hegemonic relationships that existed before as a result of previous uh, centralization tendencies, these hegemonic relationships can be dissolved, uh, they become independent and separate, and their relationships become then, so to speak, uh, one of, uh, of equals rather than of uh, a group of rulers and a group of, um, of the oppressed. Uh, this, this phenomenon of forced integration uh, exists, of course, also um, in, in various other forms. And you can quickly realize that forced integration is, of course, a phenomenon that contributes to ethnic racial hatred. Uh, in the United States, you have the example of busing, for instance. Um, so whatever blacks are transported into white districts and whites are transported into black districts, allegedly in order to promote peace and harmony. Um, but as should be should be perfectly clear, if you Im impose one group on another group, if if you ignore the natural tendency of people to uh, to segregate themselves, to live in neighborhoods with people who are similar to themselves and distance themselves spatially from those individuals or those groups that are very different from them. If you break up this natural tendency, then hatred um, is created. In the case of Russia and Yugoslavia that I mentioned, um, this, uh, this feeling of being exploited by the ruling ethnic, uh, ethnic group uh, brings about a tendency of never wanting to learn anything. Um, that is to always say whenever something goes wrong, wrong let's say in, in Latvia or Lithuania or in Slovenia or Croatia, you always blame it on the Serbs. Uh, if it would not be for the stupid Serbs, that would not have happened to us. Um, everything good happens, happening is, so to speak, uh, you ascribe to your own uh, wonderful ethnic group and everything bad that ever happens in your territory you ascribe to um, who those that, uh, that rule you. If you separate, uh, all of a sudden there is a reason to avoid your own mistakes uh, and to actually learn something from uh, from the rest of the world because you can no longer blame others. So if things in Slovenia do not go well now, after Slovenia separated from former Yugoslavia, the Slovenes must blame themselves for doing something wrong. Uh, before they always had an excuse, the Serbs uh, did it to us. So separation, uh, dissolving the previously existing uh, forced integration uh, makes the various groups more willing, more inclined to recognize their own errors and copy the practices of other regions that are more successful than they themselves are. It also, the separation of different ethnic groups and f the formation of their own, uh, own territories uh, also will make visible that there exist significantly different ranks of, um, of cultural and economic development as far as different ethnic and linguistic and racial groups 
are concerned. Um, that is, you will be, be made aware of something that the multiculturalist try to tell us does not exist. That is, the multiculturalists tell us that all ethnicities, all groups, by, by and large the same, no difference. Um, as soon as you would have separation between these groups, you would clearly see that there exist tremendous differences in the cultural and uh, economic development between certain groups and others. And again, you will then have a reason, so to speak, to aspire to imitate the practices of those groups that are economically and culturally more advanced uh, and to avoid imitating those practices of, uh, in, in, in societies in small, small groups um, that are uh, culturally and economically um, uh, underdeveloped. Um, in addition, uh, the session um, uh, also solves so to speak, the, the current problem that we have in, especially in the Western world, of, uh, uh, of immigration. Um, that is, immigration that you find in <coughs> Germany, in France, in Italy, in the United States, uh, at least the current immigration policies, are to a large extent, again, uh, forced integration. That is, people are permitted to come into the country that are not wanted by the domestic population. Um, I mean, large numbers of welfare recipients and whatever, and people from cultures who do not, that do not want to assimilate to the culture in, into which they want to immigrate. Um, if you have smaller territories, then it becomes possible that these smaller units have, so to speak, their own admission standards. Um, uh, preventing the phenomenon of forced integration that plagues the Western countries uh, currently. Um, then I come back to uh, the economic policies that these small units would pursue. Again, as I said, the direct relationship between uh, what economic policies will be chosen and the size of a territory is indirect, but nonetheless it is of, uh, of great importance. Um, now initially, of course, when we have the session, um, a smaller government, so to speak, only takes over the resources that were previously controlled by a larger, larger government. That in and of itself, that might not have any, any dramatic um, implications. But immediately, um, the small political units would be faced again with the specter of emigration going on. And in particular, they are most productive people leaving for other places. So there would be very quickly again pressure on all these small units to engage in relatively moderate tax and regulation policies so not to lose, in order not to lose uh, the most productive uh, citizens that they have. Um, in addition, small political units uh, must almost of necessity engage in free trade policies and abstain from protectionist, uh, from protectionist measures. Um, imagine the United States would say, um, we will no longer trade with anybody outside the territory of the United States. Now, this would, of course, lower the standards of living in the United States quite substantially, um, but, um, but we most likely would not have to be afraid that, that there would be a large wave of starvation taking place in the United States due to the fact that there is a large internal developed market in existence. Um, but imagine, for instance, that a place like Monaco would do the same thing. This is a little city-state. That they would say, okay, no more trade with the rest of the world, only internal trade between uh, one Monaco man and another Monaco man. Um, 
Now there you can predict that this experiment won't last more than maybe two weeks. Um, and then there would be uh, a catastrophe breaking out. That is, the people would be literally starving <coughs> on the street um, because there's no agricultural production taking place there and so forth. Um, and, um, uh, and this type of experiment that is an experiment in protectionism would immediate, immediately have to be um, would immediately have to be abandoned. Um, so small units must engage in in free trade. And again, if you look at the look at the world and look at the few places where we have small independent political units like uh, Hong Kong, Singa Singapore, uh, Liechtenstein. Um, Monaco and so forth. All of these places, of course, do engage in free trade to an to an extent that is unheard of in uh, in, in larger uh, larger states. Um, the break, um, the proliferation of independent political units would also contribute to monetary integration. Um, look, currently we have a variety of paper currencies in existence. And uh, paper currencies, freely fluctuating against each other, are of course a system of partial barter. Remember the tendency of monetary development is towards a one worldwide used money um, because the more widely a money circulates is accepted, the easier, so to speak, exchanges become. That's the purpose of money. Um, what we have in place is, uh, even now, is, so to speak, monetary disintegration insofar as we have a multitude of, uh, of currencies in place. Now imagine that we would have a proliferation of after all, borders are somehow, uh, yeah, from an economic point of view, have, have so to speak, no, no significance. Now imagine that we would have tens of thousands of independent political units. Would it then be possible that each of these tens of thousands of political units would issue their own paper money? And the answer is, no, that would be absolutely impossible. Um, because that would disintegrate the market almost completely. Um, it's almost as if we would go back to barter. Um, nobody would accept uh, whatever, Monaco money and then Liechtenstein money and whatever, and Hopper money and Jones money and who knows what it is. Um, so the pressure, as we have a proliferation of larger numbers of uh, political units, would be precisely to go back to what we once upon a time had, an international gold standard. Um, integrating, so to speak, the entire world again uh, with, one, uh, with one commodity money. Um, so monetary integration would also be uh, furthered by the existence of a large, uh, large number of independent political, uh, political units. Let me end by, by simply pointing out that we live in an age where the leading politicians and um, the various national elites seem to be all agreed on the proposition that it would be best to have uh, a one world government, to create ever larger political units. This is what we see going on in front of our eyes. Uh, again, make it clear to yourself in your mind what the danger of a world government is. There is no more any economic reason to go from one place to another. Everywhere the same tax and regulation structure applies. What I think is of great importance in the current 
world is uh, that we develop a vision of, an, of a possible alternative scenario, a vision that can inspire people to somehow resist this tendency toward ever more centralization. And this vision uh, that might inspire people is precisely the vision saying we have to have tens of thousands of places like Monaco, San Marino, uh, Andorra, uh, Liechtenstein, Swiss, can Swiss cantons, Singapore, and so forth. Um, and we need uh, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of independent uh, political, uh, political units um, that this will actually promote economic, uh, economic wealth uh, and lift us uh, on a level of prosperity that we would never achieve um, under, under a regime of uh, worldwide centralization. Well, with this, I'll stop. Thank you very much.